Propagation of radio waves can be crazy, complicated, and sometimes an exciting and surprising process. Through the years, hams have learned to use some strange and interesting atmospheric phenomena to communicate between very long distances with everyday radio equipment. The Earth's atmosphere is composed of layers that each have some unique properties. We live in the lowest layer, the troposphere, and that's where terrestrial radio communication takes place. Radio waves travel from one location to another within the troposphere, then eventually escape out into space, where presumably no one ever receives them again. But that's not always true. Once a radio wave escapes the troposphere, it's not always just lost. There are still ways for the signal to encounter a means to be reflected back to Earth. These propagation methods are widely used in ham radio for very long distance communication and include such things as sporadic e-propagation. The e-layer is a layer of the ionosphere containing charged ions and electrons that can reflect and bend radio waves. As the atmosphere moves and sloshes around, what we call weather, this ion-rich E-layer will move, spread, shrink, expand, disappear, and reappear, all the while interacting with the electromagnetic radio waves that may come in contact with it. HAMS also use satellites to bounce signals back to Earth, and even the moon and meteors. However, using what we call skywave propagation also opens up a background of radio noise coming from the sun and other cosmic sources, as well as interference from other terrestrial signals that combine with the target source signal deterioration to make it just elusive and challenging enough to make the prize worth bragging about when you can do it successfully. But from this point on, we're going to move our focus back to the troposphere and the now predictable changes it undergoes daily that we call weather. We know how radio waves travel through the air, and we can measure many aspects of their propagation through air. Also, we know the impact of air's changing properties on radio wave propagation. Properties such as temperature, pressure, and water vapor all contribute to the path and distance a wave can travel through the troposphere from transmitter to receiver. Sometimes, when these property changes are dramatic, we can observe dramatic changes in the propagation of radio waves. Aberrations in VHF and UHF signals are easy to observe because under normal conditions they travel in a straight line of sight path outward from the antenna and are not obscured by as many natural sources of radio emissions. Obviously most of us accept the fact that the earth is round. For those that don't, just assume that there are radio elves that live in the atmosphere that are responsible for the properties of radio wave propagation. As the Earth's surface curves down, away from a straight line path, away from us, the radio waves will continue to radiate outward along the straight radiated path, which, because basically it's a straight line, gradually becomes farther and farther from the surface of the Earth, and eventually escapes out into space where there are very few radio receivers, except possibly those operated by the radio elves. Normally, these are lost to earthly radio listeners, but not always. Close to the ground, weather can significantly affect the radio signal, especially the smaller wavelengths. They can be scattered or reflected by rain, smoke, dust, or other suspended particles even bigger suspended particles like airplanes. As the waves travel outward and upward through the troposphere, they will encounter pockets of air that may be warmer or colder, drier or wetter, or under different pressure gradients than when they started their journey. Generally speaking, the air temperature always decreases with altitude through the troposphere, and the pressure decreases. Sometimes, though, the waves will encounter an anomaly called a temperature inversion. 
where the temperature is suddenly warming. As there is cold air still above and below this warmer layer, the density of that layer changes, which in turn changes the speed the wave can travel through that layer. This temperature inversion can act sort of like a sandwich of air locked between two thick panes of glass that speeds up the wave entering the inversion and bends it away from Earth. Then, when the wave encounters the cold layer above the inversion, it's forced to bend just a little back the other way toward the Earth. As the wave travels back into the colder air that's more dense at the bottom of this layer, the inversion can act again as a barrier and force the radio waves to slow down and bend yet again. The wave always bends away from the denser air. In this way, the wave can become trapped within this layer, bouncing back and forth within the inversion. Depending on the thickness and expanse of this warmer layer of air, the inversion layer could be large enough to act as a duct to carry the wave through an invisible tunnel for hundreds and sometimes even thousands of miles until the wave can break free of the duct and resume a normal path. One of the most fascinating examples of this happened in 1938 at the dawn of the television era when a VHF BBC TV signal originating at the Alexandra Palace Television Studios in North London, England, was received in New York. Typically, a VHF signal, radio or television, can travel about 30 or 40 miles before the curvature of the Earth makes it impossible to receive the entirety of the signal at the ground. However, in this rare case, the waves traveled at least 3,470 miles and probably even much farther. Weather maps at the time confirmed the presence of unusually strong high pressure over the North Atlantic. High pressure near the surface will compress the lower layers of air. As the air falls toward the surface, it can start to warm at higher levels in the atmosphere. So inversions are more likely to occur. Additionally, in the fall, when the ocean water is still warm, it can create a strong inversion near the surface. Both of these conditions may have contributed to this unique anomaly and inversion ducts may have formed at multiple altitudes. Luckily, someone in New York City just happened to be monitoring an early television set and had a motion picture camera nearby with film that they were able to quickly set up in front of the screen to capture this exciting and rare moment. Variations in thickness and density of the layer may allow some of the signal to escape along the duct 
which would account for the fading in and out of the signal observed at the receiver in New York. Of course, at that time, television signals were analog, and there were really no other television signals being broadcast anywhere yet to interfere with the reception of this lone, experimental, long-distance station. Remember, at this point in history, any moving image received on this new and futuristic medium was newsworthy. Today, there are websites dedicated to providing ham radio operators with maps that reflect and predict anomalous radio propagation and atmospheric ducting using measured atmospheric conditions, solar activity, and signal reception reports from around the globe. So if you find yourself wishing that you could capture some long distance radio signals, but don't have an expensive radio or antenna, just remember, all you might need is a little unusual weather. If you like this content, please subscribe to my channel and consider donating a buck or two to my Patreon page. It will help me produce more content and help with channel expenses. Thanks very much, and I'll see you in the next one.